All right, hopefully you can all see that. Uh, yeah, thanks for this invitation and thanks for staying up so late. I know Israelis stay up later, but this would certainly be past my bedtime, certainly past any time that I would be listening to physics. And, um, works quite well for me though, it's morning here and I'm fairly awake. So I'm gonna to talk to you about photonic quantum computing and in particular try and tell you some things that maybe you don't realize about photonic entanglement. Uh, this is a slide that from our friends at Google that I think captures the issues of uh, building a quantum computer in general quite well, in as much as it shows you that uh, for a given error rate on, this, on the uh, y-axis here, you really need a large number of qubits before you get into the region of what we would consider a useful quantum computer. So useful here, uh, typically means that you can do on the order of 10 to the 12, 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 gates with a few hundred logical qubits. Okay. So we're talking about a very big device that needs to be built. Um, and in terms of uh, you know, making a qubit, well, a qubit's a qubit. There's many different physical systems that can be qubits. So uh, you know, the community has explored many of these things and there's many different companies that have started. This slide is definitely out of date. There's many more companies um, that have formed. But roughly speaking, the, you can break these companies up into two approaches. One in which you have matter-based qubits uh, and one in which you have light-based, which is what we do, silicon photonics. And, you know, the, the, I guess the, sort of a very high level, the big difference is that you're using electrons one way or the other for the matter-based qubits, and you're using photons uh, for the, for the, uh, um, for the light-based qubits. I don't know what just happened there. That's like some kind of weird scribbling on the screen. But uh, the, with the photons, I'll talk a little bit more about how we encode the qubits, but roughly speaking, you can think that you have a photon in one waveguide or another, and that gives you a, a qubit state that's either one or zero. Okay. Now, why do we want to pursue photonic-based quantum computing? Well, if you want to build a fault-tolerant, a useful fault-tolerant machine, which means that you're gonna to have to get to this regime of around a million qubits, million physical qubits, just to have a few hundred logical qubits, there's a bunch of requirements for fault tolerance that are sort of more stringent than what you need for building, let's say, uh, a quantum supremacy experiment. So you need two qubit gates, uh, you need high speed measurement. You need to be able to remove entropy from the system extremely quickly and extremely cleanly. You need uh, low noise, so you need uh, your qubits to be uh, coherent for a long time and to be robust you know, with respect to sort of external manipulation. Ideally, you would have zero crosstalk, so your qubits don't interact with each other because once you start shoving qubits together in a confined space and they start uh, interacting with each other in an uncontrolled way, it gives you all sorts of mess. Um, for fault tolerance, it's, it's going to be critical to have network ability to build small, clean modules and network those things. But that's also important for the very best error correcting codes that we know are not two-dimensionally constrained. They're actually things that, that require three or more dimensions. And with photons, you can do this fairly easily. The operating temperature, uh, you know, in principle, photonic quantum computers could be at room temperature. Um, I'm not gonna talk about cost, and I'll talk a bit about manufacturability later. But out of all of these requirements, I think I could defend photons as being uh, you know, the best choice for everything except for two qubit gates. Okay, and so this is the standard story that you'll hear is that like, okay, well, we've got to find a way of doing two qubit gains. And in terms of the methods for, for doing two qubit gates, I'll just sort of give you a, a high level summary of, of the sort of uh, basic procedures. Uh, the, the first uh, breakthrough that showed that we could use uh, photonics without having the photons interact by some intermediary system. So that if we just use uh, photons interacting through linear optics, Neil Laflamme and Milburn showed that you can actually prepare using linear optics and measurement, some very large uh, offline photonic states. And then you could teleport through these states in such a way that you got two qubit gates. And as you made the ancillary state bigger, you approached a kind of 
unit probability of success. So although this was a, a nice proof of principle, if you sort of say how big would that machine be, even if I built it in silicon photonics, it would have been about the size of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It was not a very practical architecture, but it was a, a you know, conceptual breakthrough for the field. Uh, Nielsen and myself and Dan Brown looked at, at something which brought the footprint down a lot, which was rather than do this kind of teleportation thing, you look at a way of repeating until success. So you have a, a process which is probabilistic, but you have a way of repeating it multiple times and selecting out the successes, and then you can efficiently uh, build up a cluster state, which is a particular type of entangled state that I'm not going to dwell on much in this talk. But if you have this entangled state, then you can do the computation uh, by making single qubit measurements on the, the particles in that state. And the cool thing is that whereas the KLM approach, you had probabilistic gates or gates, sorry, gates that only approach the unit probability of success with the cluster state, once you have it, you can do the gates essentially deterministic if, if of course you have an ideal cluster state. But then, uh, I think another important step was in Conrad Keeling's PhD uh, was to use um, percolation theory to look at building the cluster state ballistically. So rather than something where you've got to keep photons in memory and switch them in and out of memory while you're waiting for certain successes to happen, Conrad looked at it, build small pieces of entanglement, send them through an interferometer, do some measurements, and in, in a single step, you would generate extensive entanglement through the system and so you could show that that uh, this was universal and this greatly reduced the amount of switching and the amount of memory it basically gets rid of a, a lot of that kind of stuff and switches because they're an active element they're something that uh, tend to be high loss in photonics so reducing switching is important and then actually we founded PsiQuantum when uh, Mercedes uh, Jimena Segovia worked out in her PhD that really we could greatly simplify a lot of these ideas down to the point where we could build in a two-dimensional silicon photonic sort of pure CMOS way, the, the, all the um, necessary components to do this kind of uh, ballistic generation of cluster state that Conrad had come up with. Now, um, what this means, if you sort of look at, step back at a high level and say, you know, what is the architecture? Roughly speaking, one of these architectures is you start with some single photons, you put them through an interferometer, you make a measurement that generates some entanglement on some, um, you sort of collapse the state of the photons in some other modes to an entangled state. You then manipulate those entangled states again by putting them through operators, uh, through beam splitters, and then making measurements and so on. That's the sort of the standard approach. And you, you're dealing with the lack of intrinsic two qubit gates by sort of cascading all of these probabilistic operations, okay? But in this talk, I want to step back and say like, you know, is it really the case that we need two qubit gates? Why, why, do, why do we have this obsession with two qubit photonic gates? And maybe photons just don't want to be qubits, and maybe we should just be thinking about them as a completely different uh, kind of creature. So, uh, Wake up people, I'm gonna actually, this will be the only science in this talk. Um, and I know it's late for you. I'm going to switch to using the iPad. So I'll just stop sharing on this. I'll share the screen again. And, okay. Hopefully everyone can see my piece of paper now. Okay, so let me just sort of, uh, start with uh, what photons do like. Okay, so photons. They do like to interfere. Okay, they don't like to interact, but they do like to interfere. And uh, interference, you know, if you, if, is sort of the free field evolution. So in terms of quantum field theory, this is like the quadratic part of the Hamiltonian. It's not a proper interaction. It basically preserves the number of photons. So there's no change in photon number. And we call these sort of linear optical transformations because mathematically, just a linear operator, so a linear transformation where some 
creation operator for some mode J uh, goes to, uh, you know, uh, sum over I, U, I, J, A, I dagger, something like this. Okay. And this unitary is, is not the Hilbert space. Unitary. It's, it's the mode transformation unitary. So I have a creation operator for some mode and the modes mix up and this unitary describes how the modes mix up with each other. Okay. And now I said, okay, photons don't really want to be qubits. And then this, this, you know, to an experimentalist, this is just a mathematical description of an interferometer, a generalized interferometer that just mixes up the modes. Okay. Now photons don't want to be qubits, but as I said earlier, you can make a qubit. You can make the qubit state zero by putting one photon in mode one and one photon in mode zero, where these kind of uh, funny brackets I will always use for Fox states. And this means the qubit state so that we don't get confused between vacuum and the qubit state zero. Okay. And so physically that's just, you know, one photon in one mode and not in the other. And then it is possible to make up sort of generic single qubit states of the form alpha zero plus beta one, okay? And the reason is that if you only have a single photon involved, then this transformation up here just does whatever that unitary is on that single photon. And so you can do any two qubit unitary by just finding the right interferometer, uh, sorry, any single qubit unitary by just finding that right interferometer. Okay, but the problem is when you want to do two qubit transformation. So you you know you maybe start with two qubits in zero and zero, and you want to create some entangled state like zero one plus one zero. This is four mode four mode state, and so you would say, well, let me just take my interferometer, take some four mode state here of my two qubits. These things we we often call them a dual rail qubit. And the problem is that photons, when they come to a beam splitter, when, when sort of two photons come in on a beam splitter like this, so one here and one here, they bunch together. So you either get two coming out here or you get two coming out here, okay? And so that's taken you outside of the Hilbert space that you want to be in because this state here, does this entangled state, the sort of side plus state does not have bunched photons in it, okay? So uh, it's tempting to um, think that the photons must see each other somehow to do this interference and that there's some kind of interaction, like how, how does it know that the other photon is, is there as it were? Uh, but what's not known is, is, you know, how to sort of leverage that directly into, into a quantum computation. It's not proven impossible, but it seems unlikely, okay. So you might say, well, okay, well, I'm just going to a higher dimensional Hilbert space. Like if I have two photons, well, maybe I should just be working in a three dimensional Hilbert space where I have, you know, bunched photons. Okay. And, you know, treat this like a Q trip instead of being a Q bit. And the problem with that is that if, if you try and do this and you look at what does a beam splitter do, the beam splitter is represented by a two-dimensional unitary matrix. But to make a general qubit state, a Q-trit state, I would need to be able to make sort of arbitrary superpositions um, like this. And I can't do that, it turns out, because essentially I don't have enough parameters here. So the type of transformation you get isn't, isn't quite right. So it seems like photons don't want to be Q-trits either. Okay, and you can carry this thinking on and say that they kind of want to be something else in life. Okay. Okay. But why did we want two qubit gates? Like we said, it's not easy to make uh, two qubit gates and to make this entangled state the psi plus state. But it is easy to make photonic entanglement. And you can do it deterministically. Okay, you don't have to do it probabilistically. The point is that if you just put a single photon on a beam splitter like this, again, okay, vacuum in here, the state that you get out looks like one zero plus zero one. Okay, 
that's a single photon in two modes and that is definitely entangled okay and i'm going to describe to you because it turns out to be very powerful uh, how we know that that is definitely entangled okay so <clears throat> what's what's you know what's a way of convincing ourselves that something's entangled this was actually a, a an argument when i was a student so from the mid 90s to the early 2000s you will find papers where people are arguing that a single photon on a beam splitter is not entangled they'll say it's like a, a fake kind of entanglement so it's kind of useful to come up with an operational definition right i don't want a mathematical i don't want to just write down an equation and say that's entangled i want something that i can do to prove that's entangled so you want to, so to prove so we you know 20 years ago it was sort of an interesting question uh, can you violate a bell inequality okay so we're going to set up a kind of game where we think about there being a, a central controller okay and the central controller is doing 20 year old physics and they're uh, so they they can produce single photons and they have two phd students and they just sort of send the two photons out they put put, put one photon on a beam splitter they send them out to alice and bob okay and the central controller is, uh, is is not very smart. We'll call them uh, not a thinker or Nate for short. Okay. And so Nate, uh, you know, tells the student, "Well, make measurements and let's see if we violate a Bell inequality, right?" And the students make measurements, but the students only, if they only have linear optics, they basically can only just sort of put some beam splitters there and some detectors. And all they see is that, you know, if Alice has the photon, Bob does not and vice versa. So all they see are classical correlations. Okay. It's a pity, I don't know if I, do I have a picture of Nate? It'd be useful to, let me see. Oh yeah, yeah, this'll do. Let's, let's take a picture of Nate. This will help you focus. Here we go. Okay, so so Nate, of course, doesn't really know what to do. Uh, his students don't know, but Nate has a much smarter friend who knows photonics better and says, well, you know, what you can do if you want is you can take a weak laser. So you can take a weak laser here that has a mean of uh, one photon, exactly one photon. And in fact, if you take the laser here and you put a phase shift of phi for Alice here and take a different laser here that also has a mean of one photon, and a different phase shifter here, whoops, uh, and send it on, then the statistics you collect, you'll you'll violate a Bell inequality. Okay. And and so uh, Nate's like, yeah, that's all fine and good, but this research is funded by the Israeli Science Foundation. And they don't give me enough money for lasers. You know, there's no chance I can afford a laser. So the 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 very smart friend says, "Okay, okay, forget about using lasers. All you really got to do is uh, take the photons two at a time. So you send one photon in, and then take a different beam splitter and and send another photon. Oops, hard to draw propped on this thing." Okay, take another photon like this. Okay. And now Alice and Bob, they share two photons. Okay. And if I write down the state of those two photons and I, I split the two modes up, so there's the two modes that Alice holds and the two modes that Bob holds. Well, Alice either has both of the photons and Bob has vacuum, or Alice has no photons and Bob has vacuum. These photons have not looked seen each other this is just literally just splitting this thing up right like they, they went onto separate beam splitters they were produced by separate sources or in another part of the wave function like this they have this and that's exactly our qubit state psi plus so qubit zero one plus one zero okay 
So if all I want to do is violate a Bell inequality, I just produce the photons in it two at a time. Half the time, Alice or Bob see both of the photons and they have to just throw that away. But for violating a Bell inequality, that doesn't matter. You just need to know uh, the subset of data in which the violation should have happened. So half of the time, they do each see one photon, and now they can just run a regular violation of CHSH. Okay, so they repeat this many times. They work out, yeah, we got a, a we definitely have a Bell violation, so we know that all of the entanglement came from these single photons. So we know for sure that that initial state, that a single photon like one zero plus zero one is entangled. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, Nate being you know an ambitious young physicist is like well. Uh, I really don't like the fact that my students are wasting half of these photons. I've got to find a more efficient way of doing this than than that. So calls up his uh, very much smarter friend who understands photonics a lot better than him. And he says, uh, you know, is there some way I can do this? And I'm like, well, if you have like, you know, many more grad students, then maybe there's there's a way of doing it. Okay. So Nate writes like some grant proposal to the EU and he like mentions words like topological, schmopological or something. And they just give him a crap load of money because they don't really know what the hell they're doing. And now he's got like, you know, enough money that he can hire. In fact, he's got so much money, he can just hire faculty members as, as PhD students. They just like, they don't pay faculty members enough in Israel as your professors will tell you. So he just hires a whole bunch of faculty members, A, B, so maybe it's Alex and Barack and Dudi or Dorit or so on, and you know, noisy people like Lev and Morty and Ronan and somewhere out here, Yoshi, someone like that. And he just distributes single photons like he did before, but now instead of putting it, instead of putting uh, the single photon, um, uh, so he's still only going to distribute two single photons. Okay, so got, instead of putting it onto a beam splitter that splits it into two paths, he's just going to put an array of beam splitters that split each of those photons separately across all of the parties. Okay. So, you know, the, the first photon comes in and now, I, okay, I, I would probably draw it like this, that just make too much of a mess. So just think that the first photon, let's, let me make it say the blue photon, is now being uniformly spread amongst these parties. So sitting each each of these professors sitting in their lab, they're like, this mode here, this is my blue photon. Of course, maybe they don't have the photon because it's been spread out so much. But if they did, it would be sitting here in this blue mode. Okay. And then Nate sends them a second photon like this. Okay. And now he tells him, now run your Bell experiment. And you see the issue that we had here was that the Bell experiment failed when two photons ended up in the same lab. But now it's not possible for two photons to end up in the same lab if I take you know, the limit of a large number of professors. So think of like the, the professors to infinity limit. Okay. Uh, it's probably a scary thought for any of the students on the line. Don't worry. Um, they, 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 they asymptote to a finite amount of intelligence. That's the strange thing. So you take all of these professors, for sure, uh, they start running the Bell experiment. For sure, only two of them see a photon, right? And then they can just re report the data back to name who can check that they violate the Bell inequality. Okay. So you've, you've, in, in the limit of the large number of professors, you've, re you've removed the inefficiency of uh, the fact that you sort of probabilistically um, would sometimes get an error, okay? Now, if you know a bit about running Bell experiments, uh, actually the standard way of doing it, the measurement that Alice does is not the same as the measurement that Bob does. And that's potentially a problem here because uh they don't know who's got the photons right they, they're basically living in this multiverse where sometimes it's you know barrack and ronan and sometimes it's like 
Duty and Yoshi or something. And they don't know from run to run, so they don't really know who is Alice and who is Bob. And there's sort of two ways around that. One way is that you can actually, uh, they can all sort of locally do a unitary transformation that takes them to a, a symmetric state that they can violate the Bell inequality uh, by doing the same measurements, and then they just send that data to name. Or they could do a sequential protocol where A starts and then B and then C and then D goes like, oh, I have the photon. And then, and they've done like the equivalent of Alice's measurement. And then everyone from then on changes what measurement they do. But either way, they can still vi sort of maximally violate the Bell inequality. Okay. Um, okay, I hope that's clear. Uh, there's one more sort of thing that's uh, that's quite practically important about this, which is the following: that if uh, Doody sitting in his lab, you know, Doody's not a well-controlled experimentalist. He just applies some phase shift phi d to all of his lab. Okay, and Ronan is like a really poor experimentalist. He applies a completely different random phase shift to everything in his lab. As long as they apply, they they keep it stable within their lab. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we don't know uh, the diff you know what all these different local phases are. There's kind of a local gauge invariance, if you want a, a fancy word for it. And that's just because if you look at this state here, if if Alice applies some phi a and Bob applies some phi d, then I just I get phi a plus phi b. That total phase comes out regardless of which of these two pieces of the wave function, and I'm post-selecting out. Uh, those pieces of the wave function anyway. So it just becomes an overall phase. Okay, so where are we going with all of this? Okay, imagine now that we, we don't care about, uh, by, you know, testing local hidden variable models of, of quantum theory. What we want to do is, uh, is do useful quantum computing. Okay, so once again, Nate talks to his uh, much smarter friend who knows photonics, and this friend actually only realized this very recently and finds it extremely surprising. Okay. So if we generalize this experiment, okay, so now we don't want to violate Bell inequalities, we want to do computing, well, the natural thing to do is just distribute more photons uniformly amongst the parties. Okay. So I'm gonna, Nate's going to distribute you know, a green photon uniformly across the parties, and a pink one. And I uh, need one more color. So. By the way, I'm using different colors to represent the different photons. These photons are not necessarily different colors, obviously. All right. Now, we, we're going to say that there's n photons here and uh, let's say k parties. Okay. And I'm going to choose k sort of much bigger than n squared will suffice. Okay. In which case, uh, there's still a vanishing probability of two photons ever being in the same lab. Okay. So the two photons, uh, every lab, most people have no photons, and whatever we do from now on, at most, they'll ever find one photon in their lab. Okay. It's just a generalization of the Bell experiment. And the central controller, so Nate, gets sent, uh, like sends out instructions to people this is all just classical information. So after he's distributed the photons, he sends out classical information. And the classical information tells the parties things like, uh, take you know, the, the first, three, first three modes, the blue, red, and the green one, do some interferometer U. The interferometer might be different for different parties. So maybe there's a UL and this one does you know, some UM. Everyone does their own interferometer possibly. And then make a measurement, so do a detection, say, on this mode. And then whoever finds the photon, tell me that you got it. Okay, and so, you know, maybe in this run, Lev finds the photon, he tells Nate, hey, I found the photon. Okay. This process, uh, backwards and forwards, goes on. 
And by the end of this process, by the time you get through all n photons, it's possible for Nate to run a universal quantum computation. That process is universal for quantum computing, which quite strikingly surprised me. And the reason it surprised, well, there's many reasons it surprises me. Okay. The first is never is there more than one photon in this, in any person's lab. So that kind of uh, what we call hunger mandel interference where photons bunch into modes and something that just doesn't happen. Okay. That wasn't a part of this, uh, this game. Okay. Which is not to say these photons don't have to be identical, but somehow that was not the way they were manifesting um, that they're identical. Okay. Uh, another thing that surprised me is this local gauge invariance is still true. Everyone can apply their own total phase. I don't need to keep these labs sort of phase locked with respect to each other. Okay. Um, but the biggest surprise to me and, and is that nothing in here is like a stabilizer state. And pretty much everything we know about doing quantum computing and certainly about doing it fault tolerantly, and this, this can be made fault tolerant, is that you use stabilizer states like special types of entangled bell pairs and ghz states like one okay it's true that the case of two photons you get this kind of bell pair but as soon as you go to three or more photons nothing looks like a ghz state or a cluster state or anything like that it's also a kind of weird model because every party is doing kind of partial measurements they're interfering a few modes and measuring a subset of modes okay so they're doing, uh, they slowly eating away at the photons in their lab. And so they're doing these kind of high rank POVMs. They're not really doing um, sort of the same types of projective measurements that we normally think about. And unlike say cluster state computing where the local dimension is finite, here in this kind of measurement scenario, uh, as the computation gets bigger, the number of photons gets bigger. Now, the number of photons only grows polynomially, so it doesn't, you know, it's not like a blow up, but it's still, I need more photons and need to do more measurements on these modes as the computation gets bigger. Okay. So, uh, and then the last thing I just should say about that, you know, is that um, it still looks like a, a, a cluster state computation in the following sense that the information, like the outcomes are all just random locally. It's only the central controller who can put the correlations together, who can work out what, you know, what is the answer to the, the particular algorithm that's being run. And they're the person that by passing off the instructions to the parties are sort of choosing what algorithm gets run. Okay. So there's a lot of kind of interesting features of this model, I, uh, you know, if nothing else, the, the fact that I can take these non-interacting photons, you know, I've just used single photon entanglement spread out. And yet, because it's universal for quantum computing, it means that somehow in the structure of that entanglement, there's all the same kind of interesting things as, you know, if you study whatever topological, schmophological quantum states you want from some many-body system, here's a free field, uh, you know, scattered photons essentially has the same amount of entanglement power sitting within it. Okay, so I'm going to stop uh, talking on the iPad now. I'm going to go back to um, PowerPoint. Um, okay. All right. So uh, now. I'm going to, that was your science. You can leave now if all you care about science. Now I'm going to talk about just some crazy kind of thought that this uh, inspires in me just because I think it's kind of fun. Okay. So here's, here's the kind of crazy thought. On the far reaches of our universe, there's a, a blob. It's, it's much bigger than our galaxy called Lyman Alpha Blob 1. And we receive from that, uh, that blob, we receive polarized light. The thing about light is that it just travels through free space without decoherence. This is one of the strong advantages of, of photonic quantum information. Okay. It's just propagating out um, into free space and, and essentially just, you know, essentially negligible decoherence. This thing is 11 and a half billion light years away. Uh, yeah, 11 and a half billion light years away. So, you know, that's a, a very long T1 time for people who are into uh, condensed matter. 
So what happens though, is the wave fronts from, from that blob, they come to us on earth, okay? But they're also, you know, here's a planet on the left, you can see a planet for a completely, you know, in some completely different galaxy. And that wave front comes to earth, comes to that planet. And that's pretty much the same thing as, as distributing uh, a photon on a beam splitter, right? The free space propagation is pretty much the same thing as taking the photon and distributing it across the space here. You get slightly different phase shifts. So here I've imagined that actually, you know, an alien who wants to distribute entanglement, so I tried to give you a nice picture of an alien there, uh, that's all they have to do. We know now that it's universal for quantum computing. So the question I have is like, when we look at the, the sky, are we living in a universe that's actually fill, filled already with useful photonic entanglement? Okay. Now, how might that happen? Well, if you, if you imagine uh, an alien that is, you know, some alien species uh, much more sophisticated than us that travel from one star system to the other, every time they get to a star system, they might that you know they might say mm, this is a good this is a good node to distribute some photonic entanglement. So, what they want to do is they want to uh, produce single photon. Oh, so, sorry, they just want to produce photons in a particular mode. Okay, and now what I proved to you is that single photons in the mode. I didn't prove it to you, but told you single photons in the mode are universal. Turns out it doesn't matter how many photons. Uh, uh, in that mode, as long as you know what the number are, okay? So thermal light is not going to be a useful way to distribute entanglement, but what the alien can do, uh, so thermal light's a mixture of these number states, the alien comes in, they build a shell around the star, okay? And then they just do non-demolition measurements of the photon numbers coming out in different modes. And doing so does not change the thermal properties of the line. So we sitting here would just still just, you know, just see a thermal star. But now that alien's like, oh, now I know that there's exactly 42 photons in that mode. And they can distribute that classical information to either their buddies or future generations of themselves. Okay. And that classical information also just looks like random bits. In fact, they could probably just stick it on top of, uh, you know, because it's, it's a, basically thermal random distributions. Uh, they could stick it on top of other things that, that to us would just look like thermal noise. Okay, they could communicate it by other channels. So by doing this, what an alien is doing is setting up uh, distributed entanglement all across whoever receives those photons. And we've just seen, we receive these photons very, very long distances. So maybe when we're looking at the sky, okay. what you're seeing there, like we think, oh, we're all on our own. Nobody likes us. Nobody wants to talk to us. Okay. But maybe there's already this giant entanglement network out there. And the aliens who are sophisticated enough, they would be using it to do things like QKD or super dense coding, okay, or, or more robust quantum coding or different things. And yet everything would still look like local noise, a bit like in that quantum computation. In fact, they could all be running distributed quantum computations. And, you know, the, the only thing stopping us is that we're just too dumb to work out, like, where are the nodes of the network and, and how to manipulate whatever the particular best modes are. So that's the crazy idea. Uh, you know, maybe we can't communicate because we're too stupid, which Coco the gorilla would definitely agree with. This is Coco signing uh, man stupid, which I think is a, one of the, the best signs of any species. All right, so let me take you back. Now we come back from the craziness. Let's come back to uh, talking about building uh, the quantum computer. And I've spent this long diversion into con hopefully convincing you that just thinking about two qubit gates is possibly not the right thing to do. And yet, unfortunately, we live in a world where it's difficult, even in Silicon Valley, to get the kind of money to go build a shell around the sun and use, you know, some uh, some natural sources of thermal entanglement. And it's uh, difficult to do fault tolerant quantum computing without using qubits. And this is really, I think, just a failure of, of our uh, appreciation or imagination at some level that we, we basically, 
uh, only have a good theory of fault tolerance for qubits. Okay, and all the, all the non-qubit things that we know, we just have not developed them very well. Okay, and my hope is that you know students on the line will think maybe I should stop listening to my professors and think about some non-qubit type quantum information processing. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the other point on this slide, manufacturability. So what we do in terms of trying to hit this number of a million qubits is not to build things around the sun, but to basically just take silicon photonic components. These are kind of standard things, phase shifters, beam splitters, and so on. Um, and they can just be built in the same kind of silicon foundries that build the components in your laptop. And they're built by the same people, pretty much. We hired silicon industry engineers, but they sit there, they basically produce a CAD drawing. We, we like, you know, email that CAD drawing to a fab. The fab plays around laying down all sorts of crap for, for a few months, sends us back basically in a pizza box. It's, it's almost identically sized to a pizza. And then rather than uh, take this, uh, you know, million um, photonic component wafer and use PhD students uh, to try and, and measure it, PhD students are, um, are not really efficient and uh, they smell and things like that. So we just use a robot that can go through. And the really cool thing about this is that, remember I said that what really matters uh, is this, the, you know, the only quantum part of what we're doing is this unitary, this linear optical mode transformation. This machine can measure that unitary in that equation, but it's doing it uh, with classical light at room temperature. So we run through millions and millions of de devices and build up all the modeling and learning in such a way we don't have to do anything kind of quantum in order to get this understanding. So that's, you know, that's the sort of the key quantum part of the machine. The other parts of the machine, which I can't show you, are, are, you know, we have to take electronic chips and put them on top and all of this stuff gets done in the same places that stack together the different types of chips and interconnects and so on that, um, that your, your laptop gets built at. Uh, but uh, you know, we don't do any of that, that sort of manufacturing ourselves. So everything that we're building is done in a fully CMOS compatible and CMOS like back end of line compatible so that the whole machine can be built by people who already know how to build uh, many tens of billions or even trillions of component machines. Okay. And so we don't let our engineers do anything other than that. Now, uh, what we get out from that kind of uh, data analysis is we just get out huge amounts of information about variations of different components across this whole wafer and how they perform. That gives us like, you know, different uh, ways of modeling this stuff. And then it's up to the architects to say, all right, we now have this, you know, really good understanding of all the different imperfections in our device. So I've tried to um, I've listed here, you know, sort of 20 odd, but there's really 40 odd that are, that are relevant to, to what we can build. And so the different imperfections, uh, you know, the question is how do they all add up together and are they gonna stop us building a quantum computer? And so really what, what it takes is uh, you have to do a heck of a lot of numerical simulation to condense all of these kind of uh, photonic imperfections in the device you're building. So we have no, de remember we don't have any decoherence, but we have uh, like, let's call it control induced noise or like monkey induced noise. It's all the kind of stuff that we have to do essentially to build the stuff um, to put it together. It's all, it's all has slight imperfections in it. And we can distill down uh, those errors into essentially two types. There's erasure, which is the photon got lost, and then some kind of correlated Pauli errors if you, if you want to think in a qubit way. Okay. And that takes a team of people, the uh, optical architecture team, this is a photo of them a few months ago, you know, writing, you know, this massive code base in order to be able to just essentially get down uh, all of these hardware parameters down into essentially a bunch of process matrices and CP maps that tell us how the stuff is going to act. And then we have a completely different team, a fault tolerance team that can then map that stuff to a logical error rate. There's a couple of people in common, but really that's a, that's a separate team. And that's the team that are looking at the codes, the decoder, what type of error correction and uh, what type of classical um, uh, information processing uh, can get us down to a particular logical error rate. Now, 
in practice, what we do is we, we fix a desired logical error rate, like 10 to the minus 10. Okay. So we say like, okay, what is it going to take to get to 10 to the minus 10? And then we write down an architecture. An architecture, remember I talked about, it's like some sort of uh, ways of putting the photons together to generate some more entanglement and then do something probabilistic and then, uh, you know, uh, make some more measurements and generate some more. And I told you one extreme of that process, but there's many different architectures. Um, and then architecture A, we actually sort of backtrack through the numerics and we say, you know, here are the values, some threshold values for every single one of those, uh, of those 40 odd or whatever they are, um, imperfections, you know, your uh, tolerance to, to this component, to directional coupler efficiency is this, and it has to be below that. And so a particular architecture is a sort of set of like these parameters, and you have to be below the threshold for every single one of those parameters. And a different architecture will have a completely different set of parameters. And to the hardware engineers, building things, you know, is not, they're not, in, some, many of these, some of them are independent, but many of them are not independent of each other either. So really there's multiple architectures, there's multiple different in, uh, like hardware constraints that play off against each other. Right? And this is why it's a, it's a you know, a, a company of, we're now about 150 people. So this is about maybe 70 odd of the people. Okay. And people are like, how, you know, how can it be such a big thing? It's one of the reasons why, like, you know, when I, now that I understand the complexity of this problem, there is no way anyone's building a quantum computer in academia and there's some government is prepared to basically fund several physics departments worth of people um, in order to build it. It's, it's just a fiction. Uh, our breakup, interestingly, is about two thirds people who don't have a quantum background. They're just engineers from the semiconductor and, and, and sort of various large system uh, industries and about a third of people, out of the technical people, sort of know some quantum mechanics. So that's, us. that's what we're doing at SciQuantum. Uh, I'm gonna finish um, with uh, the conclusion that I think photons got a bad name because of this, like, oh, you can't do two cubic gates, but there's so many other things that you can do that uh, I think, you know, if you're, a, if you're a young person that's not already wedded to something, you should really look at these problems. If you're a mathematician, there's beautiful questions of, of representation theory that are very poorly understood and much more interesting than playing around with uh, the sort of Lie groups you get out of qubit technology. Um, so yeah, stop worrying, love the photons, but love them for who they are, not for who you wish they were, okay? They, they, they are what they are. Don't try and make them be qubits, accept them for who they are. That's probably good advice for most of life. And uh, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you. I'm the only one. Uh, uh, we, we have time for questions. So if, uh, if someone wants to ask a question, please, uh, I think you can open the mic and speak. I have, an, I have a question. Uh, if we have a superconducting a quantum computer, we can calculate and say that we need around, let's say, one million qubits in order to get a fault tolerance quantum computing and to to do the to implement the Shor algorithm. How many photons do we need in order to implement something like the Shor algorithm? How many photons? Because uh, the the amount you need um, is yeah. It's roughly, so it's roughly the same, but per, per let's say 10 clock cycles or something. So, you know, so the thing is that the, the time axis for us is also photons. It's not like for a superconducting technology, you, you know, the, the qubits are always there. And so the, um, in some sense, the time direction is like the same Cuban. For us with photons, like even in the, even in the sort of extreme case that I described to you, uh, I, I sort of described that as like Nate distributes all of the photons at time zero. In fact, that's not necessary because you're not gonna use all of them at time zero. So you essentially, you need to continue producing photons as you run through time. So the total number of photons, so, so the, the blow up is actually a, a just, a fairly small constant factor on a single time slice, but then it blows up by like 
as you go through time, you've got to take, you know, whatever, and time is essentially number of gates. You take whatever is the number of gates and you multiply it up by 10. So it depends on the algorithm you're running. For sure, let's say it's it's actually fairly low gate depth compared to other algorithms, but, but big in width. Um, simulation algorithms, you know, sort of much smaller in terms of logical qubits, but much longer in gate depth. But roughly speaking, you just take number of qubits times number of gates, that'll be roughly the number of photons. Okay. Uh, Moti is asking, what is the what about the losses in the silicon? Yeah. So the um, the thresholds for so when we do those those simulate. Am I still sharing the screen? Yeah. So so when we do these uh, these simulations, erasure is actually our much preferred error because erasure is a heralded error. We know when it's happened. I went to try and detect a, a photon. It wasn't there. That error, it's, uh, it, it actually, in principle, doesn't really have a threshold in the sense that I can write down architectures which tolerate 100%, up to 100%. Unfortunately, not exactly 100%, but you know, that in principle, if you were prepared to blow your machine up, you can tolerate arbitrary loss. There are codes that do that. Uh, the, the most interesting ones were published by Hector Bombin and Naomi Nickerson a few years ago. Uh, but that's sort of in the extreme case, of course, like when you don't have, when you do have Pauli error, these things trade off against each other to some extent, okay? That you don't want to be, um, like a code that's good for loss is also good for Pauli error, but you, what we care about is the footprint of the machine. And so it's not the case that we want to use highly lossy components. Um, and that would, you know, make the footprint of the machine too big. Um, but then the, you know, the, the things that I think are much harder are the, the sort of much more finite thresholds for the Pauli errors, for the stochastic errors, the unknown errors, the things that you only work out by running your error correcting code. Okay. Offer is asking, how important is to increase the accuracy of the beam splitter to reduce systematic and stochastic error? And what is the reward that one can obtain if you find a passive way to reduce the systematic or stochastic error? Yeah, so, okay, so it's a really good question. So, as I said, these things, the interplay between them really depend on the architecture. You know, what type of multiplexing are you doing? What types of beam splitters? What types of, you know, what depth of things are you putting together? So there is not a single answer to this. But pretty much with every single one, with, with any architecture, and this is not just for photonics, you do not want to do what I'm going to call polishing the firewood. You do not want to make something better than it has to be in the sense that at the end of the day, all of these things distill down to basically two types of error. And so if this, if you know, your beam splitter imperfections are not the thing that's limiting you getting uh, into the sort of fault tolerant region, then there's no point making any better. Okay. So you, you're essentially always looking at what are the things that, that are, your, you know, the sort of the problematic, it's like having the problematic children in the family, right? And those are the ones that you focus on. So yeah, like, in, you know, we, we can build beam splitters that are vastly better than, than what they need to be, but that's not like at some level you don't gain from that. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of effort expended, um, for nothing you kind of got to keep going for like what is the what's the thing that's like right at the boundary that's your most problematic component i think uh, there was quite a long question i think that answered it so. okay uh, i have another question do you have any estimation i know it's uh, it may be a secret but do you have any estimation when we will see something useful from these quantum computers yes i do i do Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. If there is no more question, uh, I can't see anything. Uh, okay. I would like to thank you, Terry. Few, one, okay. yes. one, yes. one moment. There are a few more questions. Maybe uh, people can just unmute themselves and uh, and ask the questions. I see three more. Uh, maybe I can read one, but I suggest yeah, that people sure. can just come online. So. Uh, Serge Rosenblum asks, uh, what makes this scheme fundamentally different from boson sampling, which is also completely linear, but not universal? Oh, yeah. Um, that's also a great question. I'm just trying to bring up the grid of people somehow. Kind of. 
Uh, yeah, so the, the big difference is um, boson sampling is uh, with, with no feed forward. So with boson sampling, you, you uh, it's actually like the Bell experiment, for example, could be done as a boson sampling experiment because Nate distributes the photons, Alice and Bob do the measurements, and that's it. Photons are all gone and they went back. But remember I said in that particular architecture, uh, everyone essentially uh, does some local unitary on some subset of their modes, two, three, four modes, measures some of them and announces the outcome. Then what, what Nate does is adaptive, depending on who got the outcome, what Nate tells people to do at the next step depends on who got the photon in the previous step. So it, it's, it's like, this is how these measurement based quantum computings work. So uh, uh, Nate needs to do a kind of classical, a fast classical uh, um, computation to work out like, you know, what should everyone do next kind of thing. And that's why it's not like boson sampling. So the only difference between boson sampling and this is ultimately, well, obviously we use much simpler interferometers. They, they use, okay, so th there's another fundamental difference, boson sampling, is not really a, a practical technology for the simple reason that the, to make the problem harder, you've got to make the interferometer deeper. Making a deeper interferometer means you're just going to make the loss bigger. So the, the sort of limit of that problem is no photons get through. In the, in the architectures that we follow, the world line for any individual photon is constant. So the way I just described it to you is like, you know, okay, that photon gets distributed. That means it's seen like one array of beam splitters. It'll see one more beam splitter maybe in its life, and then it's gonna get measured. So every individual photon goes through a constant number of elements, which is why we can be tolerant to loss. If, if to run the computation took more and more elements like boson sampling, then we'd really be screwed. So the answer is, is sort of twofold. One is that we have adaptivity and two is that we have much lower depth interferometers. Of course, we can simulate boson sampling by running a quantum algorithm. But, you know, why would you? It's not a useful problem. What about okay. literature? Could you give some literature uh, about what you're trying to build, something from academia so that we can read? Because we think um, slowly. Yeah, so this year we will publish, we, we're in the process of writing up some papers just because of things like IP and stuff has taken longer. The, the last sort of academic paper really is I wrote a paper called Why I'm Optimistic About the Silicon Photonic Approach, which is just sort of an overview paper. It raised a whole bunch of questions, all of which I think we've closed in the meantime, but it gives you an idea of like why, you know, what are the strengths of this? approach so um it's published in apl or something um but yeah it's on the archive so if you just look for my name it's the only paper i think i have that has silicon photonics in the title okay i have one more question maybe if, if i may yeah sure. can everyone hear us so um my i was really uh, uh fascinated by uh, what you presented with this universal approach. I think I didn't quite follow all of the details, but my last update was <laughs> um, this, the KLM scheme with all the ancillary photons. And now mm. just, uh, just a question, did I, did I get you correct that you basically managed a scheme or a model somehow that you would overcome those need of the ancillary photons with, with, the, with the distribution that you were mapping on your iPad? Some, some, I didn't quite follow that. Yeah, ba basically what you can think is that it's, uh, I mean, you know, things that are universal, they all map into each other one way or the other. But what, what you can think is that like the entanglement in, in that model that I showed you, the generation of the entanglement is deterministic. In, in KLM and in the cluster state approaches and so on, you know, you start with kind of probabilistic entanglement generation. But, um, you know, all of these things are like probabilistic somewhere. And that's true even of a circuit model, right? As soon as you do fault tolerance, you're doing measurements, and doing probabilistic things. So what we, we don't really, and, and, and I should say that that model that I showed you is a ridiculous extreme because you would never, 
deliberately spread the photon out as much as possible. It was more to prove a point. In mm -hmm. practice, what you're going to do is going to use the most compact things that you can. Okay. And understanding what those most compact things are is a hard problem. And we've made progress on it, but you know, I don't know what the full parameter space of those things is. So I think that the, you know, the real question is, how much simpler is the machine than we are trying to build than KLM? And you know, it's more than 10 orders of magnitude simpler or something in footprint. Mm -hmm. Way and, more than that. I don't, want to, I don't want to say exactly, cause, partly because I can't remember the KLM number, I only remember our number. But okay. uh, yeah, it's... Thank, thank you. And maybe one, one more thing. So for reading, you said, uh, this will, you will, or your group or something, you will, you will publish paper like in, in the very, probably in the next... We, we will time. publish some overviews of, of the approach. Yeah. We, okay, won't, so we won't publish all the details, obviously, but enough, enough that to see kind of, yeah. Okay. The root to fault tolerance, which is, cool. which is quite different to KLM or to cluster states or anything else. Cool, thank you. Then I will follow your updates on that. Very good, thank you. Sure, okay, no problem. So uh, I think we have to finish. Uh, Terry, thank you very much. It was very interesting.